Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, I appreciate you braving the frozen wasteland this morning to make it uh, to class. Um, before we get back to evolutionary robotics, uh, we have our fourth and final uh, data science slash machine learning faculty visitor uh, here on campus today, uh, Pratik Sharma. He is completing his PhD thesis at UMass Amherst on transient uh, cloud computing. It's an idea that's new to me. Looking forward to learning more about this. Um, please come and join us, 115 to 215 uh, in the Davis Center today. Uh, as always, coffee and snacks provided. So come and help us recruit a new colleague and a new professor for future uh, students. OK, and uh, just in case you missed it yesterday, anybody catch Boston Dynamics' latest video yesterday? We're going to talk about legged locomotion in two lectures' time. Legs are great, but legs are not sufficient for everything. There goes one more task that only humans used to be able to do, opening doors. Somebody here. And polite, yes, swarm dynamics, working together. There we go. OK. We could watch Boston Dynamics videos all day. OK. Um, impressive, but remote controlled. So what we just saw was a robot that is somewhat adaptive. The human operator is remote controlling the robot, but not controlling the lifting and placement of every leg and every motion of the robot. The remote controller was providing mid-level control, move forward, move back, turn, extend the gripper, uh, contract the gripper, and so on. So adaptive to some degree. The robot is adaptive to some degree, but not autonomous. So off camera, there's a human operator somewhere. So just as a reminder, the big challenge in robotics remains, which is to make adaptive and autonomous machines. And that's what we're uh, working on in this, in this course. Okay, um, assignments. So undergraduates, hopefully all of you completed and submitted assignment four uh, last night. And you are now starting in on assignment five. So you have now implemented, and this is good timing for today's lecture, a minimally cognitive machine. We got all the bits and pieces that we need. Objects, joints, sensors, neuron, and synapses, the five basic ingredients of a robot. And now in assignments five through six, we're going to gradually complexify the robot and subjugate it to evolutionary optimization. Before we do that, in the first sub-assignment, assignment 5A, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. So you're going to do a little bit of refactoring. You're going to be restructuring your code because in assignment 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, you're going to be growing your code by quite a bit. So we're going to try and make sure that it's modular and cleaned up, and most importantly, that it's object-oriented. So we're going to be introducing a number of classes uh, into your code. So if you're a little rusty on the concept of object-oriented programming, go find an online tutorial. Uh, brush up on OOP, and then you'll be all ready for uh, assignment 5A. Assignment 5B, you're going to be implementing the simplest of all possible search algorithms. Create a thousand random controllers for your robot. Try out each of the thousand on the robot, and the best controller wins. <coughs> Pretty simple, right? That's random search. Okay. Assignment six, you're going to then be working your way through more and more sophisticated search algorithms like we discussed in lecture, uh, in lecture five when we were talking about different evolutionary algorithms. Any questions about assignment four, five? Graduate students, you're moving on to assignments uh, nine and ten. You'll be moving on to assignments uh, nine and ten. And then next Tuesday, the graduate students will start in on final projects. So I'll talk a little bit about final projects uh, next Tuesday. All good? OK, so uh, we finished last time our lecture on uh, continuous time recurrent neural networks, these CTRNNs. And the important aspect of CTR, 
CTRNNs for our purposes is that typically when we evolve CTRNNs, we're not just evolving the synaptic weights. What else are we evolving in CTRNNs? And why bother? Why not just evolve synaptic weights, the influence of presynaptic neurons on postsynaptic neurons? You want to kind of evolve the structure as well? We might want to evolve the structure, the, how many hidden neurons or how many neurons and synapses there are. We didn't tackle that yet. We didn't tackle that in lecture eight. What were some of the additional aspects of CTRNNs that we did talk about last time that we're going to place under evolutionary control? How quickly they respond. So again, actually, I apologize for the quiz question. There's a quiz question about the tau values. I had it reversed. So if you lost a point for the tau question on the quiz from last Thursday, you'll have a half a point returned to you. So the tau values are particularly important because they slow or speed the response of their respective neurons to whatever influence they're getting from other neurons, from sensors. Um, so that's important, and we ended last time by looking at this little humanoid robot that could pick up a block and shake it back and forth and forward and back. And we saw this sort of bowl of spaghetti where we had some neurons in which the tau values were set to high values, which slowed the rate of response of those neurons. So those were the slow conductor neurons. And then we had another mass of neurons, and they're all interconnected, another mass that had low tau values which meant those could respond quickly to other neurons or, it, or sensors. And that was the orchestra that was connect, conducting the actual symphony, which is the orchestration of the movement of the robot's joints to do whatever it was supposed to do. So we saw in CTRNNs how there are more of these pieces of a neural network, some of which we can set by hand, like we saw in the humanoid example, setting the tau values by hand, and other aspects of the networks that we can allow evolution to play around with them. And the humanoid experiment was there to show you an example of why that might be useful. You might have slow neurons, which are sort of setting the mid-level goal. So we just saw the Boston Dynamics robot. You could imagine an autonomous version of that robot in a few years' time, where in its mind it has slow neurons saying, get to the door. And then you have fast neurons, which are controlling the movement of the legs that get the robot to the door. The slow neurons, which then switch to open the door. The symphony changes, or the melody changes, and the fast neurons orchestrate the movement of the arm to reach out and unlatch the door and open it. That's CTRNNs. Today, we're going to see a number of experiments where we're going to evolve these CTRNNs inside of minimally cognitive robots. And perfect timing, uh, because Lecture 9 goes along very well with the Winter Olympics. So we're going to have a little robot Olympics today. The, the, robot, the minimal cognition ro robo Olympics, if you like. What we're going to see today are four different experiments, four different tasks, four different events, if you like. And we're going to evolve minimally cognitive robots to complete each of these four tasks. And each of these four tasks is some building block of intelligence. Regardless of what your definition of intelligence is, you would probably want to see these four things inside an intelligent robot. Okay, so that's the minimal cognition set of experiments which we're going to look at today. The reading for today um, describes these four experiments and a couple of other ones. This was, the reading actually comes from a research paper, so we're going to switch now where some of the readings are going to be drawn from the research papers themselves. Remember that evolutionary robotics is a pretty recent field, uh, so we do have a textbook for the field, but better to actually go to the primary sources themselves. Um, so part of my hope for this course is you get some experience reading research papers uh, directly. Uh, if you don't have a lot of experience with doing that, there are different approaches. Um, my suggestion is read the beginning and the end, and then attack the middle. So read the abstract. And after today's lecture, the abstract should make a lot of sense because it's going to be a one-paragraph summary of everything we talk about today. 
Uh, and then read the conclusions. Why does this matter? So they're going to sort of summarize all the details that we're going to talk about today and why this, why this matters. We probably aren't going to deploy minimally cognitive agents out into the world, but the authors here are trying to establish a starting point. Let's start with robots that are very simple, but start to exhibit some of the building blocks of intelligence, and then we can sort of build on top of that. Okay. So let's start with uh, event number one, and this has to do with perceiving affordances. So what is an affordance? An affordance is actually an idea that comes from psychology, and this has to do with visual perception, how we actually make sense of what we see out there in the world. For a long time in psychology, the idea was, well, we saw color, we saw blobs, we saw motion, we saw all sorts of things, and we to took those visual primitives, color, shape, motion, and put them together to recognize students, pads of paper, desks, and so on. You might remember from a couple weeks back we were talking about computer vision, which in the 50s and 60s started out in the same place. Give a computer a photograph, which has raw pixel values, and get the computer to recognize chairs or not in an image. Right? When we think about thinking, or in this case, when we think about seeing, we feel like we see shape, uh, color, movement, and that's how we make sense of the world. In psychology, there was a movement in the 70s into the 80s that said, maybe that's not actually what's going on. Maybe what we're actually doing is projecting affordances out into the world. So rather than just relying on the visual cues, as those visual cues are coming in, we're thinking about how we might interact with the things that we're seeing. So before you even recognize this object as a chair, you see something and your mind simulates, what could I do with that thing? Could I lift it up? Could I burn it for fuel? Could I, whatever, could I? So the individual, how might I interact with it? And these objects that we see or perceive in the world afford or advertise different uses to us. And that's how we make sense of the world uh, around us. Okay, so here are five pictures of chairs. You might not categorize <clears throat> the fifth object as a chair. What is the affordance that all these <clears throat> five objects afford or advertise to you? You can sit on them, right? So there's a verb there, right? Rather than the noun, a chair, we're going to focus in affordances on the verb, right? All of these things could support your weight, right? And I obviously chose these five images on purpose because they are visually very, very different from one another. You can imagine in the early days of computer vision when they were trying to teach computers to recognize chairs, they started by writing scripts that said, if you see an object in the photograph that has four legs and a flat top on top of those four legs, that's a chair, which worked fine for image number one, but failed miserably for the other four. So they went back and said, okay, if it's got four legs and maybe a stem and then four branches going out, that's also a chair. Now the computer could recognize the first and the second object, but not three, four, and five, right? So they kept adding in more and more if-else statements until they had millions of lines of code, and they still had a computer that was very brittle. It wasn't able to recognize chairs very well. Again, with deep learning, we're now doing a much better job. And there's an argument now in the field of AI, even if deep learners can recognize objects, do they understand them in the same way that we do? You might be able to train a deep neural network to recognize a chair, but does it think about the chair in the same way we do? That's something that we could sit on, something that could support our weight. Right. Okay. So it's a very different way, two very different ways of thinking about seeing. Right? One is the non-embodied way. We're just going to pay attention to the pixels and nothing else. And the other is the embodied way. I'm going to simulate my own body interacting with the world and interacting in particular with this object, and I'm going to think about the ways in which my body may be able to interact or not with the things that I see. And that's how I'm going to categorize or make sense of the objects that are out there. Okay. It also matters. Context also matters. So here's four more objects. What affordances do these four objects now project to you? <laughs> uh, 
burning or heat or, or an energy source, right? So the tree stump obviously doesn't have just one affordance. It doesn't just suggest one thing to you. It suggests or projects different ideas depending on context, right? And what is context? Well, it's everything else that's going on around you. Yes? That's a very good question. How much effort should we put into making robots see or understand the world around them in the same way that we do? Um, there, there's a lot of disagreement about that. My personal opinion is we should try and get them to see the world and act in the world very similar to humans, because in the not too distant future, we're going to be sharing the same world. And we want robots to understand the world around them in the same way that we do. If they have a different understanding of things, in my opinion, that's going to lead to dangerous situations. Right? A robot that doesn't understand that these are objects in which a human can sit, so you can also understand affordances not just about how I can interact with the world, but how other agents in the world might interact with that object. If robots can't understand how humans might interact with objects, again, we might run into, into trouble. Okay, so that's affordances. So we're gonna, in the, in the first of the four Olympic events today, we're gonna try and get robots to perceive affordances. They're not gonna see the affordances in the same way we do, but they are gonna learn to see their world based on how they might interact with the world. So let's have a look at our first minimally cognitive agent. It is a square. It exists in a 2D, uh, I wouldn't even call it a physics engine. There's some minimal physics in there. Um, we have this little agent down here. You can see there are seven gray lines emanating uh, from it. What do you think those seven gray lines represent? Ray sensors. Ray sensors, right? So you've already implemented some ray sensors. So this robot, at every point in time, gets back seven numbers from its seven sensors, which are the length of those seven ray sensors. That's it. It has two motors. Um, we've seen motors connected to rotational joints. We've talked about motors connected to wheels in the Breitenberg vehicles. Now we've got two motors that are connected to two rockets. And these rockets can supply more or less thrust on either side, depending on the two numbers arriving at the two motor neurons. So inside the square uh, agent, we have a CTRNN. That CTRNN has seven sensors and two motors, and all this robot can do is move back and forth along the bottom of the screen. So you can also think of this as Olympics for Space Invaders. We've got our little robot at the bottom of the screen, and they're gonna be, in all four events, you're gonna see various objects falling from the top of the screen. In this first event, we're going to see object pairs, and these object pairs are connected, they're gonna to fall together but there are going to be apertures, or the width between these two, ob these two objects is going to be wider or shallower. And the task for this robot is to perceive this object, which is a pair of objects, and decide, is this object passable or not? So now we're using an adverb, right? So it's an, it's an, we're, trying, we're, going to, we're going to try and train these robots to sense an affordance, which is, can I pass through the middle of this object pair, and it has to decide whether this object is passable or not, and it's going to show us that it knows whether it is or not by going between the objects if the aperture is wide enough for the square robot to pass between, or run away if the aperture is too narrow for the object to pass between the pair of objects. Okay, simple event for us, not so easy for our robot. On the right-hand side, we're going to see the development of the fitness function. In all of the experiments we're going to see today, we have a population of CTRNNs. We're going to take each CTRNN, drop it inside this robot, and evaluate that CTRNN um, num trials times. I think it says in the paper, uh, that doesn't really matter, 20, 100 times. We're going to evaluate each CTRNN multiple times. So what we're going to assess is how good is this robot at perceiving affordances 
on average. How many times does it get things right and how many times does it get things wrong? So the per overall performance P of a given robot is going to be the average of P sub I, which is, which is its performance in the ith trial. Make sense? Okay. In some of these trials, the aperture is wide enough for the robot to pass through. In some of these trials, the aperture is too narrow for it to pass through. So let's have a look at um, this term up here. This is when the opening or the aperture is too narrow. And we're going, to use, we're going to compute d sub i, which is the horizontal difference between the robot's horizontal position and the horizontal position of the object pair when it hits the ground. Remember that the pair of objects is going to fall. When it hits the ground, we take the uh, horizontal difference, and that's d sub i. And in most of what we see, we're going to take the absolute d sub i. doesn't matter if the robot's on the right or the left, just how far away is it from the center of this object pair. How is uh, this term rewarding or punishing the robot when the opening is too narrow? We want this robot to avoid the object pair when the <clears throat> aperture is too narrow, run away. So it gets 100 points if it does not touch the object at all, which is good. We don't actually care if it misses the object pair. We don't care how far away it is. You just get 100 points if you miss the object pair by a millimeter or if you run a meter away from the object pair. doesn't matter. If the object pair is falling and it hits you, your uh, P sub i in this case is 2 absolute D sub i. What is this rewarding or punishing? What's the worst possible thing the robot can do in this case? Try to go right down the center. Try to go right down the center. So the object pair is falling, and the aperture is too narrow. The robot's not going to get through and gets hit by the object pair. It's sitting directly underneath the object when it hits, which means d sub i is equal to 0. So you get 0 points. Disqualification. That's OK. Sure. That's right. And, um, it tries to make sure that the space between the two blocks is, is that space big enough if it were to fall directly over it, it would not get hit. Exactly. So if the aperture is wide enough, what we're going to see when we look at this piece, if the aperture is wide enough, stay in the middle and let both objects fall on either side of you. And remember the, ro the robot can move back and forth, left and right, along the bottom of the screen while the object pair is falling. Yep. So if it moves, so Does it get, like say, say that again. So for instance, if it did have enough space, where yep. it could just sort of let it fall on either side of it, does it get more points for realizing that it could just stay in one spot? Or uh, is it just that it's like, oh, I don't know if it's big enough, and maybe it's the size of the thing? I see. Does it, does it matter whether it moves yeah. or not? We don't care. So in all these fitness functions, you can see actually on the right-hand side, it's always just d sub i, which is the final horizontal difference between the robot and the point at which the object pair collides. We don't care what it does in the meantime. Just at the end, be in the right place. That's it. Right? Remember, in evolutionary robotics, we're trying our best to not tell the robot how to do something, just what we want it to do. Thread the needle, thread the aperture when it's wide enough. Other, other case, run away. So when they say wall, if the agent collides with wall, that means the two objects. The two objects, sorry, yeah, that, that should just be when it collides with the objects. That's right. And then they must have tuned the i so that 2 d i is well less than 100, I assume. I think so. That's why the 2 is there. Okay. So the worst thing you can do when the aperture is too narrow is be right underneath and get a d sub i of 0, d sub i of 0, disqualification. If you're underneath and you still get hit, but you moved a little bit away from the object pair center, so d sub i is a little bit greater than 0, then you get a couple points, right? A little bit further away, you still get hit, more points, 
And then eventually you produce a descendant through evolution, which doesn't get hit at all, and you get 100 points, the maximum, in that single case. Remember that each CTRNN is seeing multiple trials, right? So in one trial, the aperture is narrow, sufficiently narrow. You have to miss. What about, yes? Sorry, what's that's the if beyond blocks case again? Zero. If beyond, uh, that's we're looking at just this, oh, just generic. this case here. So oh, this sorry. case, yeah, it's it's not written well. This case is for if the aperture is too narrow, mm -hmm. and this case is if the aperture is wide enough to get between it. There's an error in the paper um, in this second case here when the aperture is wide enough. Um, you get uh, zero points if you're beyond the blocks. So if the aperture is wide enough and you run away, you have failed to perceive the, the correct affordance, which is that that object pair is passable. Right? OK, so you get zero points in that case. You get 100 points if you're between the blocks and they do not touch you. That's exactly what we want the robot to do. And that's how the robot shows us that, we, that it was able to tell through its seven ray sensors that the aperture was sufficiently wide. If the aperture is sufficiently wide and it gets hit, we're going to apply this calculation here. Tell me about this calculation. So the inverse of the top one, right? Wants you to miss, but miss being as close to the thing on your face as possible. Exactly. Miss the object. So you're getting you're getting hit with by the wall, so you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing yet, but at least you didn't run away. That's good. So now you can see there's a minus d sub i in there, right? So we're trying to minimize d sub i in this case. The larger d sub i is, the further you are from the center of the object pair and you get hit, the worse your penalty, right? So you can remove this penalty here, this minus 4. Uh, absolute d sub i if you're as close to the center line as possible. And if you get sufficiently close to the center line, you won't get hit. You're between the blocks and you get the maximum. So the 80 and the 4, again, these are the investigators sort of tuning, tuning the fitness function to reward for moving between the object pair. Make sense? Okay. So uh, they evolved populations of these CTRNNs in this minimally cognitive robot in this very simple task. And for every CTRNN, they applied this fitness function. And they eventually evolved uh, one CTRNN that got very high fitness. They took that champion out of the population at the end. They put that CTRNN back into the robot. So evolution is finished now. We've evolved a solution. We put that best CTRNN back into the minimally cognitive robot and expose it to a whole bunch more of falling object pairs. We want to see how does this evolved solution do, how well does it do, or, sorry, what does it do? We know it gets high fitness. How does it behave? So in, a lot of, in the rest of these slides, we're going to see a lot of analysis now of evolved solutions. So rather than looking at a curve showing how fitness is improving over evolutionary time, we're assuming that's already done. We're going to look at just one evolved CTRNN. Yes? Uh, sorry if I missed this, but that's okay. the, do the blocks start off in line, or do they start off in random positions? Uh, that's a good question. I, did, I didn't mention. They start um, at different horizontal positions at the top of the screen, and they fall. In some cases, they fall uh, at slower, faster paces. I think in this first event, they all fall at the same velocity, but they can fall from different uh, st uh, starting horizontal positions at the top of the screen. Yes? The blocks are at the same elevation to start. The blocks, with. yeah, you can actually, they, they're, they're welded together. They never move independently. They fall, fall together. Yeah. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So we took that single evolved CTRNN, and we're now going to drop a whole bunch of object pairs that have smaller or, or narrower or wider aperture width. So a negative aperture width means it's narrower than the robot. So minus two means it's two units more narrow than the robot. I don't know if this is metric or imperial. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. It's smaller. And this is much more narrow than the robot. So zero relative aperture width means if the robot holds absolutely still or gets right 
underneath the pair, perfectly centered, and stays absolutely still, it will not get hit. It'll get brushed on either side. Right? Positive aperture width, the width is wider than the width of the agent. Okay, so they had a whole bunch of these object pairs that had wider or narrower apertures, and for each one of those objects, they dropped it at different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. So each uh, point here corresponds to one of those object pairs, and you can see it particularly for this object pair, these two narrow lines here represent error bars, and what error bars are showing you is sort of the the breadth of values that the robot obtained for all of those cases in which the object pair was whatever that is, point, point oh 0.01 wider than the robot. Okay. How did this particular robot do? Was it optimal? Did it do absolutely the right thing every time? What would you expect to see if the robot was behaving optimally? It's not behaving optimally. Well, that it would be like all positive, because to me that's what's backwards, that the that when it's wider, it's doing very bad. When it's doing wider, it's doing bad. Uh, yeah, may, maybe it's worthwhile talking about the horizontal, the, sorry, the vertical axis here. So this is the final horizontal separation, the D sub I of the robot and the object pair. So what does a value of 40 mean? What happened in those cases? What did the robot do in those cases? It ran away. It ran 40 units either to the right or the left of the object pair. Doesn't, doesn't matter, right? Ran like the wind. Okay, so when the, when the well, aperture width was four units narrower than the robot's width, it ran away all the way up to here. What about on this side? What does a D sub I near zero mean? It stayed in relative place. Now remember, for each one of these points here, we're dropping the object pair from different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. So it, it also has to move and get underneath, right? And then maybe it stays still. Can't tell from this picture. But it has to get between the object pairs and have a D sub I near zero when the object pair hits the ground. Where were things difficult for the robot? Oh, right. Uh, close to zero, it seems to still be moving on. Exactly, close to zero. So if we look at this particular point here, when the aperture is wide enough for the robot to get through, we can see that we have very large error bars. So what that means is the mean d sub i, the average d sub i for that, that set of object pairs was near 20, but sometimes the robot ran away and would run away 40 units, and sometimes it would stay still and do the right thing. So what this, these large error bars are showing is that the robot is kind of uncertain. It's not quite sure what to do when the aperture is a little bit wider than, than its body. Probably a good thing to do. So we have a robot that's slightly conservative here. It's a little bit paranoid. It says, I'm not quite sure I'm going to run away half the time, even if it's big enough to, to thread the needle. As I, I think I mentioned before, evolution is not an optimizer. It doesn't always give us optimal behavior. It's a satisficer. So it'll give us something that's satisfactory, that's good most of the time. And when things are difficult, who knows? Sometimes it'll do the right thing. Sometimes it won't. Let's have a look at the two panels at the top. A lot of the figures in, in this lecture series take a little bit to digest. So we'll take our time here. What we're looking at in this top left panel here is we're going to drop, uh, again, a bunch of object pairs. And this is the same evolved CTRNN, just one neural network here. We're going to drop from a bunch of horizontal positions 140 units above the robot. And at the bottom, we're going to represent, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Horizontal axis here is going to show the horizontal, dist uh, horizontal position of the robot relative to the object. So if we look at the line that starts in the very top left of the top left panel here, it has minus 40. What does that mean? What does it tell you about that particular object pair? 
Robots at the bottom of the screen, the object pair is at the top of the, of the screen. Where is that object pair? Horizontally relative to the robot. <coughs> it's way off to the side. It's that line up here is 40 units to the left of the robot. And then that object pair starts falling. This line that starts in the upper right of this panel started at the top of the screen 40 units to the right of the robot and then started falling. Make sense? So if you count all of these lines, we're going to test whatever that is, 20, 30 drops of the object pair. And in this case, the object pair has an aperture that's too narrow for the robot to get through. Okay. How does the object pair fall? Does it fall Diagonally, does it fall straight down? Does it accelerate and decelerate? Straight. straight down, right? So you can see as you march from the top of this panel down, you can see all the lines are vertical. So the vertical position of those, uh, the vertical position of those objects are falling straight down. So the relative horizontal position between the robot and the object pair is not changing. So we know the object pair is falling straight down. What about the robot? The robot's moving left and right, uh, like uh, one to see if it can fit and then to actually get into position. It's going to have to, right? But right at the beginning, in the first 20 units here, or the first the time period during which the object starts 140 units above the robot and falls to about 120, what is the robot doing during that period? Exactly, right? The horizontal position between the object pair and the robot is not changing. All those lines are perfectly vertical during that time period. The robot is not moving. Is it thinking? Is it deciding whether the aperture is narrow or wider? We don't know. All we know is that the object pair is falling vertically and the robot is perfectly still. What happens after 120? to move around 80. It starts to, it starts to move, right? So uh, it starts to move at different points. So actually with the, the two inner groupings of lines, the robot starts moving when the objects are at 120. And if the object started falling further to the left or further to the right of the robot, it moves later. So we're starting to see the robot does different things depending on the object, different object placements, which tells us the robot can see the object pair and it's responding to it. So we know the CTRNN is making use of the seven ray sensor values. So it's doing different things in different circumstances. Uh, are those ray sensors, are they able to see the entire field, basically, in length? That's a good question. I think, I think uh, not quite. All, almost, but not, not quite. So even in the leftmost and the rightmost band of lines. It might initially not see them, but they fall and then it does see them. And it still stays still for a while. What else can you tell me about this particular robot's behavior, given the upper left panel? Uh, it seems to, once it sees it, it seems to move uh, close to it horizontally. Okay. You can see that when the object pair gets to about 50 units above the robot, all the lines are coming together. So that means that in all these conditions, wherever the object is falling, the robot gets underneath it and is looking up. Then what happens? What happens after that point? It's hard to tell what it looks like tries to overshoot the other side of the... Yeah, it's the, kind of hard to see where these lines cross, but whatever it does, it either runs way to the left and ends up minus 40 units relative to the object pair when it hits, or it runs 40 units in the other direction and ends up at plus 40 horizontal position. So it succeeds in all of these cases. It sits, it's looking at the object, starts to move around, gets underneath it, and then takes off. When did the robot decide, put decision, decide in quotes here, when did the robot decide 
this object is not passable? When did it realize the correct affordance being projected by this object? Uh, at about 3 o'clock, which is in 60. Why 60? That seems to be where it identifies that it's too, um, the gap's too small to fit and then skip out of it. Possibly. So if I was to put a chair in front of you and ask you to make a decision, is this sittable or not, and you go and sit in the chair, did you make the decision when you start to move towards the chair? Did you make the decision when you sat in the chair? Did you make the decision before you even moved? Who knows? Same thing here. We don't know. All we know is the robot did the right thing. This robot is telling us by running away, this object is not passable. We have no idea when it made the decision and uh, how it made the decision. And I'm putting decision in scare quotes because decision usually means a discrete event. Yes, it's passable or no, it's not. It may not even be a discrete event. It may be unsure for a while. It says, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm getting more and more sure, more and more sure, more and more sure, I'm out of here. Who knows? We don't know from this, this picture. Last thing from this upper left panel, what else can you tell about the robot's behavior in this case? Does it do something unique every time in each of these 30 cases? however many there are. Not really, right? There seem to be sort of four discrete bands. It sort of seems to be lumping all of these situations into four cases. Lumping these, case, these situations into four cases. Who knows what it's actually thinking, but it seems to be dealing with them in slightly different ways. Okay, let's go to the top right panel now. Same evolved CTRNN. Now we're going to drop uh, another object pair 30 times, and now the aperture is passable. How did the robot do in these cases? Did the right thing, right? It ends up under, directly between the object pair in every case. Excellent. How did it go about doing so? It seems to have followed uh, basically the same process that we saw when uh, the gap is too narrow, except uh, once it makes that final decision point, it stays at that uh, zero relative to horizontal. That's it, right? So the pictures look the same up until about 40 or 50 units above, when the object pair is 40 or 50 units above the robot. Looks the same. So if you just look at the robot's behavior, you might say the robot has no idea whether it's passable or not. And only when it gets to 50 does it start to differ in its, its behavior, right? So we might say, oh yeah, it's obvious, right? Thinking about thinking is clear. This robot decided at whatever it was, 52 units, it's passable, it's not, and changed its behavior accordingly. We're not sure, who knows? It seems like, at least for the middle ones, we're actually following, it looks like it goes down and at some point, it goes off to the side a little bit to kind of get a better view of the Maybe, right? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of movement here. So you can see the direction of these lines changes from time to time. That's the robot going to the left and then the right. So it's sort of sweeping the undersides of the object pair with, with its ray sensors. We saw this when we talked about the gantry robot, that inverted periscope, right? An important aspect of seeing is motion. An important aspect of seeing for you is also motion. Your eyes saccade from point to point. Same thing here. It seems the robot has an easier time, easier in quotation marks, who knows whether it was easy or hard for the robot, has an easier time if it moves around a little bit. Okay, let's look at the panel uh, over here. Again, one evolved C, T, or an N. We're going to look at a whole bunch of different objects. Uh, sorry, we're going to look at a whole bunch of object pairs that are passable or impassable for the robot, and we're going to drop them from different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. So now we have a whole bunch of pixels, and the coordinate of, that, of any given pixel tells us what was the relative aperture width of that object pair and where was it dropped. The color or the grayscale of a pixel, we're going to color it white when the robot did the correct thing. And the correct thing is be between the objects if they're passable and run away if they're not. A gray pixel means the robot got hit by one of the two objects. Regardless of whether the object pair is passable or not, the one thing you're not supposed to do is get hit by the obstacles. Black is the robot did the wrong thing. It ran when it should have stayed. 
or it stayed when it should have ran. If we had an optimal question in the back? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, so an optimal robot or an opt optimal C CTRNN would be all white, right? Clearly, it's not optimal. We see some gray and some black. Where is this robot having a hard time? Similar to the other picture, like that line in the middle where it's really close to fitting, but it feels like it feels in the So the, right, exactly. So this horizontal band here, this is when the aperture is just about the same width of the robot. This is a hard thing to do, right? You might look at a very flimsy chair and be not sure whether it can support your weight or not. Is it a chair? Is it, is it not? Is it sittable or not? But it also has a really hard time when the initial position is straight above because you get that vertical black line. So that means that even at twice the aperture, um, it has, or two and a half times almost, it has a hell of a time doing the right thing. That's it. So right up here, the aperture is super wide. This is an easily passable object pair, and it's centered at x equals zero. So this means the object pair started falling directly above the robot. This seems like a no-brainer. This should be a simple one for the robot to do, and did the wrong thing in this case. It ran away. Hard to say why, unless you look at the details of the paper. If you have a look at the details of the paper, you'll see that during evolution, they were using all of these situations. So remember that each CTRNN is evaluated a bunch of times. Those are all the times that it was evaluated during evolution, whatever that is, 30 different uh, number of trials, and that's where the objects were placed. So that picture, if you look carefully, will explain why there's a line here. Why is there a line here? The CTRNNs, ne during evolution, they never saw an object dropping from above them. So they, there's sort of a blind spot in their understanding. They understand passable and impassable most of the time, unless you place the objects directly above, because they did not see that during evolution. One of the open challenges in evolutionary robotics in particular, but robotics and AI in general, is making machines that are robust. So they're able to do the right thing in a situation they've never seen before. This is very, very difficult to get a robot to do, and here's one example of when it fails this miserably. Super difficult to do and super important. Let's say we train some flight control software for an airplane, and we say during testing, it, did, it landed the plane perfectly every time. You can go ahead and board this plane and it's on autopilot, no problem. During evolution, it always did the right thing. You better hope that that evolved flight software doesn't uh, incur, encounter some situation that's different from what it saw during evolution. It matters. So I, I told you at the beginning of the course, we want to produce adaptive and autonomous machines. We also want to produce robust machines. They can deal with novel situations. Hard thing for a robot to do. We'll come back to that later in the, the course. Okay, let's move on to event number two. So we just looked at affordances. Another important thing as you move about in the world is being able to discriminate between self and non-self. This is self, this is self, everything else is non-self. Seems like a trivial thing to do. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Got a, one of the first things we need to learn. We've already seen a robot that performs self, non-self discrimination. Where did we see this robot? What was this robot? The baby, the baby bot. Remember the robot that was moving around and pushing objects in front of it? It also saw its own hand moving in front of it, and it learned that this was self because whenever it sent motor commands, there would be motion in its visual field. Whenever it stopped sending motion commands, the motion, uh, whenever it stopped sending motor commands, motion stopped. So BabyBot could learn to discriminate between self and non-self. Let's have a look at a minimally cognitive agent that also tackles this uh, challenge. We have now in a mobile agent, the circle agent, which also has seven uh, ray sensors, but it can't move left and right. It has only one motor neuron, which is going to rotate its little arm in front of its field of view. And at the end of that arm, 
is a little hand, a smaller circle, and that hand can obstruct or occlude any of the ray sensors. So it can break the ray sensor so the robot can see itself. It can see its hand, and it can also, it can see its hand, and it can also see other objects. Now we're just going to have single objects, and they're going to fall, and they might fall at different angles. And the task for the robot is to move its hand back and forth and catch the object when the object passes when the object passes in front of the robot. So all of the objects are going to fall and they're going to hit this circumference somewhere on this line. And the robot's hand has to be exactly there when the object gets there. Okay? So we're going to do the same. We're going to start like we did before. We're going to evaluate each C, T, R, and N multiple times, num trials times. And P sub I is going to be the performance in the ith trial. And we're now going to introduce theta sub i, which is the angular error at the end of the ith trial. So angular error is my hand is here, but the object hit here. What is the angle between these two vectors? So do we want theta to be small or large? Small, right? We want to make we want theta sub i to be zero. We want the angle between where the hand, uh, where the arm is and where the object is to be the same. Okay, so again, there's a little typo in the paper. Um, we're taking one minus the minimum of these, these things. First thing to note is that theta sub i, we're subtracting theta sub i. So anytime in a fitness function you see minus something, you know that that's usually a penalty term. Right? We're trying to make that thing be as small as possible. We're taking the absolute angular error, so we don't care if object is here, sorry, we don't care if hand is here and object is here, or hand is here and object is here. All we care about is that, that angle. Okay, so uh, we're taking the minimum there because uh, we're going to try and normalize this so it goes between 0 uh, and 1. 1 minus 0, the best thing you can do is theta sub i is 0, so 1 minus 0 is one, best thing you can do. And we're going to normalize the minus term here so that it, one minus one equals zero is the worst possible thing you can, you can do. Okay, okay. so we evolve, uh, we evolve a population of CTRNNs. Each CTRNN is evaluated num trials time. You keep going, keep going. When evolution finishes, we pluck out the single CTRNN that gets the largest P that does the best in all the P sub I trials that it saw. And now we drop that evolved CTRNN back into the agent, and we want to see how well this agent did. And that's what this picture shows us. How did our uh, evolved CTRNN do in this case? What would an optimal robot be doing? Be like the straight line and then like the text because you want the final arm angle to match the incoming angle. Exactly, right? We should have, in an optimal case, we should have a whole bunch of dots lined up exactly along y equals x. And these error bars, remember these error bars are showing that for this situation, they might have dropped, um, they might have dropped multiple objects here that all hit at this object, at uh, this angle here. So final object angle. This is where on this circumference the object hit. They might have been falling with different speeds at different angles, and they're all hitting at exactly that angle. The error bars here mean that the robot's hand was not always exactly where the object was. Sometimes it was a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. So it's a little bit shaky. It's getting its hand in more or less the right place, but not, not every time. It seemed to have particular difficulties around here. The larger error bars show that it's having a harder time there. And also, out, way out here, when the object hits all the way to the right of the robot, or out here, all the way to the left of the robot. So again, we have, uh, we've evolved something that's good, but not optimal. Yes? What's that term for the uh, absolute value of theta? Uh, is it pi over 4? Pi, pi over 4. So we're, we're trying to normalize, 
We're trying to normalize that term. So the minus term here is going to, if you work it out, it's going to range between 0 and 1. Right? 0 means, for that term, means the robot did the best thing it could possibly do. And minus 1 means it did the worst possible thing that it could do. OK. OK, this is the most challenging figure to wrap your mind around, so we'll take our time. This is um, showing, again, for just that single evolved CTRNN, the robot is waving its hand in the air in front of itself as the object is falling towards it. And we want to try and understand, how did the robot do? We're going to take a whole bunch of objects. So we're going to place them at different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. And they're all going to fall so they hit the robot dead center. They hit the robot right in front of it. So what it's supposed to be doing is whatever it's doing with its hand, that hand should end up right in front of it to grab the object when it hits right in front of the robot. We've got a whole bunch of ob objects that are basically falling like this. Make sense? Each curved trajectory that you see here corresponds to one falling object. If you look at the top of this image, you'll see that the trajectories are bunched into two groups. The left-hand group corresponds to those which are, oh, I'm sorry, did I, did I explain that right? Always takes a while to get this, get this right. They, um, let's see. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The grayscale, the color of the trajectory, corresponds to the horizontal position of the object. So light lines correspond to objects that started falling from the left and hit mid-center. And dark lines, let me try that again. Dark lines, <laughs> dark lines are objects that were started falling to the left of the robot and hit mid-center. And light lines are those that started falling to the right of the robot and hit mid-center. That's the color of the line. Make sense? OK, the position of the trajectory, so we've got these two groups. We've got a left group and a right group. The left group is the investigators took the robot's arm and cranked it to minus pi sub 8. So they manually moved the robot's arm to an initial position of minus 0.8 and then dropped the object. And the right-hand side of trajectories, they pulled the robot's mm -hmm. arm to the right by pi over 8 and dropped the object. OK, so in order to understand this picture, let's follow one of these lines. Let's start in the left. Let's start over here. So we know the line started to the left, so the robot's arm was pulled to the left. And we have a light line. Let's follow the light color color trajectory here. So we have a light line, which means the robot's arm is to the left, and the object started falling from the right. Follow that line. What did, that, what ha what did the robot do when, the ro when that object first started falling? We're going to follow that light-colored line from the top of this figure all the way down to the bottom. What is the first thing the robot did? Uh, it's moved, it moved its arm away. It moved its arm away. So you see that the light colored line at the left went even further to the left. So the, the horizontal position of the line itself is indicating the angle of the robot's arm. So the object is falling this way, and it moved even further to the left. Why did it do that? Who, who knows? It's hard to see, but underneath that light colored line is a dark colored line, which Let's see, where does it pop out? Around there. What is the object? So again, the robot's arm is to the left, and we have a dark colored line under there, which means the object also started from the left. What did the, ro what did the robot do in that case? How did it start moving? We have this dark colored line that started on the left. What is, it, what is the robot doing when that object on the left starts falling? Well, it looks like they kind of follow the same path. It starts by following the same path, which makes sense. So if I'm trying to look at one of you and my hand is in the way, I want to move it out of the way so I can see it, right? That makes sense for the dark colored line. It doesn't make sense when the object is falling over there. Why am I doing that? Who knows? 
So like we saw before, in a lot of these cases, the robot starts with more or less the same strategy. And you can see actually on the right, the lines also do that. So the robot, every time, regardless of where the object was placed, and regardless of whether its arm was cranked initially to the left or cranked initially to the right, it always started by going like this. Okay. Generally speaking, what was the robot doing the rest of the time? It's complicated, but overall, what is the robot doing? It seems to be wiggling its arm left and right of the object until it finally grabs it. It's, uh, it's moving its arm a lot, right? Every single one of these trajectories is reversing direction. It's oscillating. So the robot is waving its arm like crazy, and most of the time, it's sweeping its arm across its visual field. If I asked you to perform this simple task, you'd probably do it like this, right? You'd look and see where the object is, figure out where it's going to hit, and then put your hand there, right? So our robot is now doing something very different from what we would normally do, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. For the CTRNN, the fact that it's continuously obstructing its field of view with its own hand isn't difficult for the CTRNN. It's not making it more difficult for it to solve the task. In every case, when the object hit front and center, the arm ended up right there. Did it wave around for a while and get its hand there and then hold it there until the object hit? It's waving it the whole time and times things so that its hand manages to be in the right place at the right time. Okay. You'll notice again that the robot seems to cluster um, all of these situations into distinct groups, right? which is kind of interesting. If we could ask this robot, which we can't, it might say, yeah, yeah, I, if, if, the if the object is falling from the left and my hand happens to be more or less on the left, then I do this kind of thing. If my hand is to the left and the object tends to be falling from the right, I do this other kind of thing, right? It might, it looks like it's um, coming up with different situations, again, in quotation marks, because we don't really know, but it, that's what it looks like. It seems like there's a fundamental disconnect between the in terms of humans and the robot, in the sense that humans are rather lazy. That the robot there's no, doesn't seem, at least, they didn't say that there's any penalty for using energy. Absolutely, good catch, right? So whatever you need to do in the world, you're, all, you're trying to optimize several things at the same time, right? Make it to class on time and stay hydrated and fed and all sorts of things, right? This robot in the Olympics has one thing that it has to do, everything, forget about everything else and just do this one thing. We don't care how much energy we use, right? So that's probably one of the likely culprits to explain the difference between how the robot solves the task and how you might solve the task. So that would be an interesting experiment. What happens if we put in an additional term to the fitness function to uh, penalize for too much energy usage? Would it do this and wait and then only then bring its hand back in? Maybe. It doesn't seem too far off from certain situations that evolve in biological systems like yep. fixed action patterns. So uh, yep. in like egg rolling in yeast is a classic example. If you take the egg away, they'll still try to roll it towards it. So it seems like it's responding to initial cues or parameters and then following out some fixed action pattern. Exactly. So a fixed action pattern. More, more or less, this robot is doing, it has one basic thing that it's doing. And sensory input modulates that basic behavior a little bit. It pushes the robot into different situations. But generally, it's doing the, the same thing, right? So it's lazy to some degree in that it's not evolving a different strategy for every different situation. It's saying, I'm going to wave my hand back and forth and then sort of see how things are going and get my hand there at the right time, which is actually, in retrospect, probably a good thing for the robot to do because if it evolves a solution of never looking at its hand and then its hand comes into view, it may not know that it's its hand. Is that the object? Did, I, did one of my ray sensors just brush the underside of the circle, or is it my hand? I don't know. So maybe by doing this, it's getting robust to its hand. It's saying, OK, I'm moving, and I see changes in, my, in the lengths of the ray sensors. That's me. But this other thing is falling, or the ray sensors over here are changing in some. They're decreasing, decreasing, so the object's probably over there. Over there I go. Okay. One of the things I like about these set of experiments is you really start to get a feel for what kinds of solutions evolution comes up with. Sometimes they're things that are familiar to us, and sometimes they're kind of strange. 
Okay. Let's move on now to a third and important component of uh, cognition, which is memory. We've talked about this before. How can we force a robot to have memory? Well, here's one way to do it. We're going to now have a robot which also has two rockets. And you see now that the ray sensors are dashed lines. <clears throat> what this means is that as long as the robot stays still, it gets seven values from the ray sensors. The moment it starts moving, for the rest of the evaluation period, it gets all zeros on those seven uh, on those seven ray sensors. So the minute it moves, we blindfold the robot. So it's going to have to remember where the object is, not just where the object is, but in what direction it's falling, and figure out how to get there and be there when the object hits. <clears throat> okay. Pretty simple fitness function. We're going to try and minimize d sub i, which is the distance between the, the robot and the object when it hits the ground. Be where the object is when it hits. OK, evolve, 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 evolve. Take the best CTRNN and play it back in multiple situations here, where we have the final object position. So this is where, at the bottom of the screen, horizontally, the object hit. And where was the agent at the bottom of the screen when the object hit? We want those two numbers to be the same, be where the object is. So an optimal robot would have all points right along the y equals x here. We see that that's not the case. Where is it having a hard time? As always. Which situations is the robot having a hard time in here? At the extremes when it's like super far on the edge. Exactly. So it's having a hard time out at the edges and also when it's falling straight from above. Probably again because during evolution they never drop the object directly above the robot falling vertically. Okay. So let's take our CTRNN and, and again let's try and understand what it's actually doing. So now we're going to do whatever that is, 15 different trials and we're going to drop the object from different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. In every case the object is going to fall straight down. How does the robot solve this task? Now it's lazy. It stays still at the, until it hits the edge sensor and then moves over at a constant rate. Possibly. So it definitely stays still. The lines at the top are all perfectly vertical for a little while. So the robot doesn't start by moving which is a good idea because the moment you move, you go blind. So it stays still for a while, and then it starts moving. Does it move differently in these different situations? No, right? If the object is to the left, it always moves at a constant speed, and it just keeps moving, and it times the, it's timed this out so that it gets there when it needs to be, right? So you decide uh, what your top speed is to get to your next class, and you wait uh, at your dorm until the last possible moment and start moving at your max speed and you get to your class just on time, right? Okay, good strategy, works fine for the robot. Doesn't work very well for these two vertical lines in the center, because again, maybe it didn't have experience with that during evolution. And it also has a hard time with the ones that are far to the left or far to the right. Why do you think that is? So the gray lines are showing that it didn't do didn't quite catch the object in those cases. Is it just moving at a constant speed? Like it waits like a very short amount of time before it starts moving, but now it has to move a lot and it might not get those lines. Exactly. So remember how these how these sensors are arrayed on the robot, right? It has a cone of perception above it. So if an object is falling and just brushes the right hand ray sensor and then falls below this cone of perception, like the black dot is about to do. That's it. That's all the robot has. So in the two cases to the far left and the two cases to the far right, the robot has a very short period of time during which maybe just the right-hand sensor or maybe the two rightmost sensors saw the object for a very brief period of time. So it may not be enough time for the robot to know exactly where it's going to hit, but it still does pretty well. It gets within the neighborhood of where the object is going to, to hit. So it's doing pretty well. So we can start to explain 
the failures here or the partial failures for one of two reasons. Either it's a novel situation from the robot's point of view, didn't see this during evolution, or because of the robot's body, its cone of perception and the fact that it goes blind when it moves means it's going to always have a hard time with these cases. Here again is we're showing um, the final object position where it hits the ground and the final agent position. And these are now for diagonally falling objects. So we're making things a little bit more difficult now. The objects are falling at different angles. And again, our robot is having a hard time with these at the center and at the extreme left and the extreme right. Let's look at, again, all these pictures are from just one evolved CTRNN. Let's take a whole bunch of objects, drop them from the top at different horizontal positions at the top of the screen, but they're all going to fall uh, diagonally now. So it's not enough for a robot to just say, aha, my leftmost sensor was triggered for a tenth of a second, go that way. It has to know, know not just where the object is, but what direction it's falling. What does the robot do when, the, when, what does the robot do when these objects are falling diagonally? When they fell straight, the robot stood still and then moved to go catch it. What happens now? Clarifying, so yep. as soon as it starts moving, it can't see? As soon as it starts moving, it cannot see. It can choose, quote unquote, it can choose when it wants to start moving. It's up to it. In these pictures, it seems like it's moving diagonally almost instantaneously. Okay, so the robot is not moving at the beginning of these cases. These are all objects that start falling diagonally. Okay, so the robot is still. The objects are falling diagonally. So again, this is the horizontal uh, position here of the robot and the object. So we know the robot starts moving when any one of those lines has a kink in it because the objects don't change direction. So the only way, we, the only way that, so we know the robot is moving because there's a, this kink in this, this line. So object, objects are falling diagonally, and during all this time in here, in all these trials, the robot is staying still, and then it starts moving. What can you tell me about the motion of the robot? So the robot seems to be standing still and watching the object as it falls, and then maybe, I, I can't say for the robot, but maybe yeah. judging um, where, where it's going to move and whether it's going to collide. And then once it's, it goes far enough past, it seems like it completely moves diagonally, it moves to the position where it can start colliding. That's it, right? So who knows? It look, it's obviously waiting a shorter or longer period of time to move now. So the lines have kinks in them at different vertical positions. So it's waiting longer or less time. When it starts moving, it doesn't move straight. So it moves and then reverses direction and starts move, moving again. This is not the robot sweeping the sensors underneath the object because the object, the robot is blind at this point. So there's no real need to do that, but that's just what it does. So it's hard to say why it's doing it, but the likely explanation is the strategy it's hit on is if I sense the object, so my race, I'm still, my race sensors are being stimulated, <coughs> stimulated, 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 and suddenly they all go back to their maximum length. The object has fallen outside of my cone of perception. And given what I'm going to remember, I know how to move to capture it when it gets there. The top right panel, we have exactly the same CTRNN. We're now going to drop a whole bunch of objects from top center of the screen. And they're going to fall at different diagonal uh, velocities. And the robot sort of shows the same pattern. I don't care how close the object is or, or the speed at which it's falling. I'm going to wait to do my thing when it falls outside of my cone of perception. <laughs> okay. We don't have time to do the fourth and final one, but let me just do a teaser for this one, and we'll finish it on Thursday. We now have pairs of objects that are falling independently. This is the... The, uh, the final event of the Olympics. This one is really tricky. We've got a pair of objects falling independently in different directions at different speeds. They start at different vertical heights. Some are closer, some are initially closer, some are initially further from the robot. And as they fall, the robot has to go and grab the object that hits first 
and then hustle and go and catch the object that hits next. Tricky, and yes? Uh, is the robot speed unlimited? Or? The robot speed is limited, is not unlimited. Mm -hmm. Difficult to do. Think on it, and we'll see the results on Thursday. Thank you. Okay.